since I've spoken at a nursing home kind of facility, but you know, you, you have to provide what they can understand. Mm-hmm. You think about it, there are people in nursing homes who are on the edge. And their attention is not distracted by jobs and kids and all the other things that people get distracted by. And this might be one fantastic time to really present the gospel to them. So in some way, shape, or form, we're going to do it. I'm going to find out some more information this week. Joan? Did you say Kingsway Manor? Kingsway Manor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amen. So there was or was not the gospel? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. And uh, if... Uh, you know, gentlemen, and you want to present the gospel to some people in need, it's, it's, a, it's a terrific opportunity. Really, really good opportunity. Uh, Sharon. We had a nursing home nurse who was overweight and bowel reactive, and she came to us probably a year and a half ago, and she was having trouble with her bowel. And she Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, it's, again, it's you know, a lot of time through life, and I don't know what these people are like, but if they're like most people, they were distracted and too busy and didn't have time for church, and now it's God has graciously limited their alternatives. And so this may be a great um, venue for them, you know, to go to and says, you don't get a lot in nursing homes. That's for sure. All right. Um, anybody else? Very good. Nathaniel, good to see you tonight. So, you graduated. <laughs> Do it, no, um, Enrique graduated. So that so there's a difference: the one year program versus the program that you're in. Okay, so you didn't get like a one year certificate and then continue on. Okay, you, you're you're continuing on. Well, that's really good. So it was last weekend, May 16th, was uh, his graduation. Is he home now? Okay, yeah, I have to get hold of him. Well, that's good. That was terrific. He called me up a couple weeks ago and asked if I, if I could possibly make to the graduation. Of course, I couldn't because I was far away. I'd love to have gone. And uh, so I'm really happy for him. So you finished up the semester. Did you pass anything? <laughs> that's terrific. David, I told you. <laughs> I know that's really good. Uh, New England Baptist College is a great college. You know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Pastor Townsley, and uh, he's just doing a really good work. It's hard work, but it's a, it's a really good work. Um, all right, well, we'll, we'll get some more deal, details from you later, and um, so at this time, we'll have another song. Another mic. 559. 559. We'll stand in again and sing, Sunshine in My Soul. 559, there is sunshine in my soul today. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky, for Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today, a carol to my King. And Jesus, listening, can hear the song I cannot sing. 
Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is springtime in my soul today, for when the Lord is near, the dove of peace sings in my heart, the flowers of grace appear. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, where the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now, for joys laid up above. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Amen. Good singing, maybe seated. So we're going to have uh, a business meeting after this service. Uh, so this may be <laughs> the shortest sermon you've ever heard. <laughs> it's getting really old. <laughs> but it may not be. Just for the record, it may not be. And, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly like that. But you're on to me there. And in conclusion, <laughs> which conclusion is this now? No, it's... Um, Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to uh, Proverbs chapter 11. Uh, we were talking with uh, Pastor Wade Prime this morning, interestingly enough, about this topic, and uh, uh, talking about soul winning. And uh, Lighthouse Baptist Church, we've never had a really robust soul winning program. It's been, it's been regular, it's been consistent, there's been times where it's been better than others. Last couple of years, a little bit less, so I think COVID got us off of our stride, and um, so it's, it's picking up sporadically, but I really want to encourage everyone to be available for a Saturday morning visitation. And, and let me emphasize, it is not just Saturday morning, but Saturday morning, we can, when we can work together corporately and encourage one another, instead of having two, maybe three, four, five, six people there, I mean, that's terrific. It's really good. If you're going to go... Um, maybe I'll just say this. We'll be here at 11 o'clock on, on Saturdays. Uh, I, I say that because in the past, sometimes for convenience sake, I would just call Brother Mike, and we're going to meet down in the stockade section or wherever it is that we're meeting as opposed to coming here because it was just a loss of you know, 20, 30 minutes. But we'll be here at 11 o'clock on Saturday mornings, um, and um, I certainly encourage you to come. It's exciting. Now, how many of you ever been out door-to-door -door visitation? Right, fantastic. That's terrific. I remember the first time going out. Um, I think it was my very first time going out. I, I went out with, uh, I think it was uh, Pastor Duke Herget. Could have been with my brother Tom, but I think it was Pastor Duke. And we were in a trailer park up in um, Half Moon, Clifton Park area. And I remember thinking, this is so weird. <laughs> I'm going to go knock on this person's door and talk to them. And I knew it was important, but I, I just meant from a personal experience level, it was awkward. It felt, it felt right. But it was really, it was really different. I've never done this before. But I'm with my pastor, and we're going door to door. I'm like, this is exciting. You know, I've always been one of those ones that says, you know, if you haven't tried something, ah, why not go ahead? Obviously, with now we have biblical standards and guidelines and so on. But if if you haven't been door knocking, why not? Other people do it, and they live, right? So it's, I mean, it's it's exciting. You really, no one dies from door knocking. When was the last time you heard of someone dying door knocking? It scares the daylights out of you sometimes. It makes you really nervous. But going door to door visitation, you know, people rely on like Facebook and Instagram and I don't know, Instacart and <laughs> whatever that other delivery service is. 
You say, oh, well, we'll just reach everybody through social media. I like social media. I think it's a terrific way to reach people. But you're doing it the same thing as 7,000 other people are doing it. You know, you're not the only one out there. But when you go door to door, there's nobody else at that door. And yes, it's one at a time, but it's one at a time attention you're giving to people. And a lot of times, most times, they're just friendly. Every once in a while, you get a terrific visit. Rarely do you lead someone to the Lord at the door. It does happen. Uh, most, sometimes the most frequent uh, good response that we get is a really engaging conversation. You talk to them, maybe schedule a follow-up visit, invite them to church, and, oh, I've been thinking about going there. I was at the church up the street, or we've just been in the area for a couple months, and I'm thinking about going to church. A lot of times young couples will do that. We don't really go to church, but now that we have a little one, now we're thinking about going. So these reminders, we, we're the, that prodding that people need. No one else is going to do it. Well, there are cults out there doing it, but they're not giving the gospel. Uh, but going door to door, rescue the perishing. And in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, we see that, in, in, well, we'll read this verse, we'll pray, and then I, I want I uh, us all to, to receive a challenge from this. In Proverbs 11, verse 30, it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the word of God tonight. And Lord, our lives can be very complex. They can be very busy. They can be distracted with so many other things, some of, of measurable value. But Lord, very few things, if anything at all, could ever rise to the level of, of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ the need for people to repent and trust Christ as their Savior, to receive the, the grace of God, the, the free forgiveness and the salvation which you so richly offer to such undeserving people. But Lord, people will simply call upon the name of the Lord, realizing that the finished sacrifice was once for all completed in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no need for any other. There will never be another sacrifice for sin other than that of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, it's our honor to lift it up. It's our honor to convey this truth to other people. And it's needed that we would convey this truth to other people. There is no other way that they can be saved other than the gospel of Jesus Christ and by receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, we pray you'd give us boldness. Father, we pray that you'd give us opportunity. And, Father, we pray you'd give us a change of heart and a change of mind, a, a quickening, Lord, a, a, a conviction that we would be more earnest in our pursuit of souls. And we thank you for what you're going to do. Help us to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This is a calling for all that would be wise. The Bible is very clear. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. I mentioned this morning, I asked Pastor Prime when he was here, have you ever just, you look around, like I was at the airport, you know, my big, my big, uh, my big uh, philosophical meeting or spiritual meeting for the week, I was just impressed, challenged by the incredible need that's out there. Pastor Pete and I met oh, about a year ago for breakfast, and he said, you ever look around and, and realize there's so much that needs to be done, you feel like you're not making any difference? Have you ever felt like that? I know just starting off in the ministry as, as a Christian, I remember hearing our church was supporting missionaries, and we had a missionary in Africa, great Africa's going to get saved. We have a missionary there. You know, there's no sense of perspective, the work that's involved. But boy, it sure is exciting to have missionaries in all these different places. You know, I, I just want to pause. I don't want to digress too far, but I've had this conversation with several people recently. And one person in particular was saying how much they wanted to be a missionary. That they want to be a missionary. It's not something that's available right now. And it truly isn't. I agree with that conclusion. It's not available right now for various reasons. But I, I said to this person, I never want to take away from missionaries, never want to take away from their calling, but what do missionaries do? Missionaries receive a call, they're in the States, let's say, wherever they may be, let's say they start off in the States, they receive a call from God to surrender, to give up their life here, to present themselves as a living sacrifice, and go to, and pick a country, pick any country. They're called to a particular country, and what do they do? They're out there, Knocking on doors, or, or in, in uh, Cuba or Haiti, they don't call it door knocking, they call it ho dogging. And uh, but just the cultures are different. What are they doing? One by one, reaching people. What's, what's Paul Frizzell doing in Bolivia for the last 30 plus years? 
He's been going door to door, reaching people one by one. And, and as the ministry grows, you get to plant a church here or a pl church plant there, develop ministries, meet with the men, meet the women, meet with the children. But it's all about the gospel. And so what do missionaries do? They go over there and do that. Don't ever think that you're a second-class citizen. When you think about the blue sky opportunities that God gives humans, believers, to serve him, we say, oh, I wish I was called to be a missionary. We are missionaries right here. This is not platitudes. This is not overreaching. This is reality. We are here to reach our Jerusalem, our Judea. We knock on these doors. We reach these people. We're doing the very work that we so, so rightly honor and respect and admire in those wonderful missionaries. That's what we're doing here. It's nothing less. And so to this person, I, and I had this conversation probably one or two more times, very interestingly, in the last two weeks with a couple other people about missions. And I said, I never want to take away from missionaries. I, they are my heroes. I, I love missionaries. I love missions. They are my heroes. But never forget, what we do here is what they do there. We are, we are bearing the burden with them. And the Bible says in Proverbs 11.30, he that wins souls is wise. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people might look at it and say, you're not very wise. And you know what? They'd probably be right in one way, shape, or form. But the Bible says, God says, he that wins souls is wise. If you've never led someone to the Lord, and this is a challenge I want us to strongly consider. And it, do, and it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter how long you've known the Lord. Think about how many souls that you've personally led to the Lord. And I'm not talking about a quick run through a prayer list. I'm talking about dealing with someone, explaining the gospel, not overcomplicating it, because remember, a child can receive but clearly presenting the gospel and then encouraging them to pray, to repent, and to receive Christ as Savior. Think about how many times you had that opportunity to do it. I don't know how many times I've done it. I'm, I'm, I don't even try to remember those things. I don't pretend that it's thousands by any means, but over the years, I don't know. I really don't know. But the honor and the, the responsibility of leading someone to Christ, if it's something that you haven't experienced, and I'm not going to ask for raising a hand, something you haven't experienced, why not commit right now to the Lord, God, by your grace, I would love you to use me to lead someone to Christ. Not just refer someone, not just give a gospel, which is awesome, awesome in and of itself, but to be ready, willing, and able to lead them to the Lord, to encourage them, to explain the gospel to them. Lord, I want to be that person. That's, that's wonderful. It's a great place to be. And will God, will God open up more opportunities? I am personally convinced Yes, he will. I believe you'll have more opportunities to present the gospel as a result of presenting yourself to the Lord than you would have if you didn't present yourself to the Lord. I think God will respond to that. Now, will, will it result in someone this week coming up to you and asking you, how can I be saved? Probably not exactly in that way. But you may be surprised what God does do to a willing servant. A calling for, the, for all those that would be wise. I want to be wise. I, would, I, I want to be a wise man. You want to be wise. We all want to be wise people. And so we see, he that wins souls is wise. And it's all about rescue the perishing. You know, again, my, my airport moment, just looking around. I'm not in those situations very often. That's why it was so kind of stunning to me, just looking around and realizing once again how many people there are just running around, disconnected, unsure of their eternal state. I'm unsure of it. They may or may not be. I'm sure there are believers in the crowd somewhere. But it's just, the, the need is so drastic. I was in, um, uh, oh, in, in that movie we were watching downstairs. Remember that movie night we had? And the fellow was talking about, I, I believe it was in that movie, correct me if I'm wrong. They're talking about a couple of preachers looking out of, uh, over, uh, out of a balcony in England. And, and the three preachers are saying, what do you see? And the one person said, I'm going to paraphrase, and I'm going to probably make it a little more concise, but what do you see? Oh, I see wonderful architecture. There was a fairground here and buildings of the city, and they were there. What do you see? I see, I see wonderful architecture. I see a flourishing society. Oh, what do you see? Well, I see people enjoying time together and, 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 and uh, the special relationships and the, just the blessings of God. Isn't it a blessing? The third preacher said, I see souls that if they die without Christ, you'll spend eternity in hell. Now, out of those three, Travis? That was Deal Moody said that. Was that in that movie? Part? Oh, was it? Okay, thank you for clarifying that. 
Okay, it was in the devotion that we did, uh, in, that, that you brought, right? That you brought at the men's meeting. No, that was terrific. So which one of the three was more accurate? Well, D.L. Moody, right? I see souls. And when we see it like that, it's a sobering reality. We're not, we're not like a gazelle playing among the tall grass anymore. We're, we're de- looking seriously at people, realizing I, I may be the only Bible they ever, they ever see. I might be the only one. And think about this. This is what's so incredibly important, especially in this area, what the least biblical literate area in the country, according to some studies. You might be the only one to ever challenge them with the gospel. I don't remember one clear presentation of the gospel. I had a couple marginal encounters, I think, with the gospel. But I don't remember a single clear presentation of the gospel before my brother told me about Christ. Not one, not one, one clear presentation. And since getting saved, maybe one, maybe two, In the last 30 plus years, did someone ever come up to me? And I don't walk around looking saved. I mean, how do you look saved? But I don't think, maybe a couple of times, and I'm guessing, but it certainly wasn't a lot. Someone come up to me and say, hey, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? How many people have done that to you in the last six months? Has it happened to anybody in this room in the last six months? Probably not, because no one's doing it. That's why if, if we want people to know Christ Unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, we must be the ones to tell them. And so we have this, uh, it's a calling to be wise. It's also, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, it's special training by Christ. He puts a very special emphasis on this. Matthew 4, 19, very, very well-known passage of Scripture. In verse 18, just set it in context, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And that is someone who catches men. Talking about their souls. Not building a group. There's no follow-up to this. It would imply anything other than the catching of men and dealing with their souls, the eternal state of men. I will make you fishers of men. And how can they be fishers of men? Pointing others to Christ. You know, Sharon, you said it before, hey, we're just beggars telling other beggars, hungry people, where to find bread. And it's Jesus Christ. It's the bread of life. It's not you and I. We know this. I mean, sometimes perhaps we worry that they think we're some self-righteous person that it has absolutely nothing to do with it. We are simply telling other people where they can find and the only place they can find eternal life. So the challenge I want us to think about is, have we led someone to Christ? I'm not going to ask for raising of hands or anything like that. Have we attempted to tell someone about Christ? And I do want to open this up. Uh, you know, now if you want to raise your hand, that's fine. I'm thinking more of like Sunday mornings, maybe a testimony time with someone that we got to, uh, to witness to Christ, uh, someone we got to witness to about Christ uh, during our week. That's an encouragement to other people to hear, oh, that's how it's done, or I could do that. Uh, someone you talk to in the produce market, uh, you might be comfortable handing someone in the drive through line. You know, that's always a very sudden thing, isn't it? Um, or other places. But telling people about Christ. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. You know, there's a lot of things we can do with our lives. We can build empires, but nothing will ever compare to the value of a soul. Nothing ever will compare to the value of one's soul. That's how important it is, and, and it's so wonderful. And I love the availability. Just go back to my first point on, on how we look up to missionaries, what a great work they do. Well, guess what? We are missionaries. I'm not stretching it. I'm saying that's our call. We're ambassadors for Christ. Where we are, who we are, in the area that we, that we live, and, but what it does take, and this is going to be my third and final point for tonight, is it takes surrendering our personal rights to Christ. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Again, I, I go back to that first encounter, how door knocking. I don't even know if I could find that trailer park tonight. But I remember, it was a sunny day. I remember as we were walking down the road, there were trailers to the right, and this one particular one, and I think we went to several that day, but this one particular one had tan siding. 
just a simple, I think, single wide mobile home in a mobile home park somewhere up in Clifton Park. And that was where I, I, I had the first wonderful encounter of going door to door knock, going door to door visitation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 19, 9, verses 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul, of course, he's writing to the Church of Corinth. This is his first letter to the Church of Corinth. And he's explaining something very important. He says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. This doesn't mean absorb the culture and reflect the culture where you are, but it does say that we are to relate to people and meet them where they're at. You know, there's, if you've been through any soul winning courses, anybody been through soul winning courses? From Mike and I, you've been through six or seven. Travis, Amy, soul winning course? Hey, Joan, you also? Okay, fantastic. That was a very good one. There are some that, um, and I don't have a clear example in my mind, but some are, they're very, uh, very rigid, kind of plan, you know, plan A or plan B. You know, the, the main thing is presenting the gospel, presenting the word of God. My point that I want to emphasize tonight is not everybody's coming from the same position. And it really takes some Holy Spirit discernment to realize what it is we're supposed to say. And we shouldn't wait until we get this, this inspirational moment when now we feel like we have the word to say, no, go ahead and serve. Go ahead and try to talk and let God bring to your remembrance. Let God bring the words out uh, as they're needed. But not everybody's coming from the same place. And the Apostle Paul said, for though I be free from all men. So he's free. He's free. I'm free from the law. I'm dead to the law. <laughs> I like that. I am dead to the law. The law's not dead. I'm dead to the law. I, I appreciate it. I, liberty in Christ is terrific. I don't have to work for my salvation. I'm free. I'm a free man. I've, I've been forgiven. My sins have been, uh, I've been pardoned. I'm, I'm going to, uh, I, my destiny is secure. It's wonderful. And so Paul knew, knew all about that. I'm free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Do we have to go door knocking? Do we have to go out of our comfort zone to tell someone about Christ? For your salvation? Absolutely not. Nope. In no way, shape, or form. But boy, to be pleasing to God, we do. We really do. Because we are his mouthpiece. And if we look at our circle of influence, there's probably not a whole lot of people who have the same circle of influence. Believers who are, who are, who are, uh, who are interested in presenting the gospel. There's probably not a whole lot of people in that same circle of influence. Even if there were, why wait for them? Why not be the example for them? Surrender personal rights. Now, I think about this topic, and it's, it's always motivational. There's never been a time when I've considered soul winning, the value of the soul, where I've said, ah, no big deal. Got that down. It's always a challenge. It's always compelling. It's always a, a wonderful reminder from God on the, on the daily, daily, daily need we have to reach other people with Christ. It, it's, it's the way to be wise. There may be a lot of reasons why people want to be wise, they want to be considered to be wise. But the Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. Obviously, there's different parts of it. There's sowing the seed. There's watering the seed. And then there's being there for the harvest. And I love the, the times over the years when I might meet someone and they'll say something like, yeah, my grandmother used to tell me about that. I'm thinking, oh, what a great, what a wonderful grandmother you have that would tell you about this. And I love the idea that God would direct our paths in such a way that as a seed was sown and perhaps watered, and then God brings us around, disconnected from the first source, just to demonstrate his perpetual care for that individual. My grandmother used to tell me about this. I remember hearing about that when, when I was a child. I heard about that. But my friends used to take me to Sunday school. Or I went to a neighborhood vacation Bible school when I was a child. And boy, that really resonates with me. Special, special uh, uh, calling. And uh, he that wins souls is wise. We have special training by Christ. And then lastly, surrendering our, our personal rights. It, it's not about us anymore. It's not about us. And let me just finish with, with two verses from the book of Jude. And I think these are also very, very compelling. Jude, a very small book, just before the book of Revelation. 
Jude verses 21 and 22. Jude chapter, uh, verse 21 22. Keep yourselves in love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference. And then verse 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Uh, we are literally, literally rescuing them from the fire. Literally rescuing them from the fire. What do we do? We're, we're just getting out of our comfort zone. And we're looking for those opportunities. Sometimes our lives settle into a pattern. It's not bad. It's just sometimes our, our lives will settle into a pattern where it seems as though our outside connections are, are very limited. They're, they're not a lot. I remember when we were, when, uh, years ago, when we'd have friend day. And, and we'd tell people, oh, invite your friends. And my kids were so frustrated by that. Their friends were at church. <laughs> And I said, well, that's kind of a good thing, but there's nobody to talk to. There's nobody to invite. He said, well, go find somebody. But it was pretty frustrating. They wanted to invite people to, to church and to he, see them receive Christ. And it's because we are literally rescuing people from the burning. People have no idea the value of, of, this, of this incredible task. But we do. They don't, but we do. And that's why. We'll intervene. Why we'll bring up that awkward conversation prayerfully. And, and uh, there's a lot we could say about prayer with that. And I hope you, you know that. But we should precede this with prayer and ask God to direct us in all this. But the value in the work of, of giving the gospel, it, it, I, it almost doesn't matter whatever else we do with our life. It all pales in comparison to telling other people about Jesus Christ. Rescue the perishing. It's, it's a great call. It makes our lives important. It gives incredible value. We're going to end with a, a song of invitation. Five hundred and fifteen. Five fifteen. Stand and we'll sing. We'll bring that tempo down just a little bit. Make it a little more contemplative. Rescue the perishing. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Father, there are many, <clears throat> Lord, that we come across, that, we, that you've given us the opportunity uh, to present the gospel to. Lord, whether that be just a track we can hand them or uh, whether we have the time to open the scripture uh, and give them a full presentation. But Lord, one way or another, um, we have that opportunity and too often we allow it to pass. And we uh, lose that opportunity. We pray, Father, you'd help us to be more faithful in our duties as ambassadors as representatives of heaven uh, to uh, bring the gospel to a world that is lost. 
And Lord, we, we pray that we be a little more conscious of those that cross our paths, know that it's highly likely they don't know you. Lord, help us to be faithful, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.